Welcome back to part two of our chapter 10 lecture on the kinetic theory. Uh, we left off talking about equilibrium um, the last time we saw each other, and right now we're going to talk about a concept called the Chatier's principle. So before we were talking about liquids in a closed container, and we said that they will reach dynamic equilibrium with their vapor, but this happy system in equilibrium can be disturbed by placing a stress on the system. Now, the Chatier's principle is an important concept that we will talk about quite a bit in a later chapter. We're just going to discuss it a bit today. Le, Chatier, Le Chatier's principle states the following. Uh, when a stress is placed upon a system, at equilibrium the system will shift to relieve that stress now what exactly does that mean when a stress is placed upon a system at equilibrium the system will shift to relieve the stress. Well, let's take a look an at an example. Here we have water liquid at equilibrium with this vapor. So, the rate at which the liquid is evaporating is equal to the rate at which the gas is condensing. Obviously, this will be a closed system. So, think about um, the last discussion where we had a bell jar over top of a beaker of water. Eventually, the vapor will saturate the air above the liquid and some of those uh, vapor particles will come back to the liquid phase as some of those liquid particles are turning into the gas phase. When the rate at which evaporation equals condensation we say it's at equilibrium. Now, if we heat this system, what do you think will happen? Will the system shift to the right and produce more water vapor or will it shift to the left and produce more liquid water? Well, to help us determine this, let's decide whether energy is required or released when evaporation occurs. If energy is required, we will place the symbol for heat, a delta H, on the left-hand side of the equation. If energy is released during evaporation, we will place the symbol delta H on the right-hand side of the equation. Now think about what evaporation um, is from our previous discussion. Remember when you, get out of, when you get out of a swimming pool on a hot summer day, what do you start to do? While you're drenched with water, even though it might be 90 or 100 degrees outside, you begin to shiver. Why do you begin to shiver? Well, because evaporation is a cooling process. It consumes energy. So evaporation consumes energy from the surroundings, thus we call it an endothermic process. That means it consumes energy. And delta H should be placed on the left hand side of the equation. So we're going to go up here and we are going to put the symbol delta H on the left hand side, meaning heat is required for this liquid to turn into a vapor. Now, let's consider Le Chatier's principle. Will the equilibrium shift towards the heat or away from the heat when the system is heated? Well, think about this. If heat is added to this system, will the equilibrium shift to the left and create more heat? Well, no, that will compound the problem, won't it? When heat is added to the system, the system will shift to the right to move away from the heat or to consume even more heat. So, we say that this equilibrium would shift to the right and more gaseous water would be formed. Here, let's think of this system. Let's think of water. Now look, this is a tiny bit different. See how that says S? I mean solid water as at equilibrium with its liquid. The process of melting is occurring as I go to the right. The process of freezing is occurring as I go to the left. So think about this at zero degrees Celsius. What's water doing? Well, some might say it's melting. Others might say it's freezing. And the answer is yes, it's doing both at the same rate. So, how can I shift this equilibrium to the right? Well, once again, let's decide. Is it exothermic or endothermic? Well, I claim for a solid to turn into a liquid, heat again is required. And delta H is on the left-hand side. 
So how could I shift this, shift this to, the, to the right? Well, I could add heat. Adding heat will cause this equilibrium to shift away from the heat. It will consume heat and more liquid would be formed. Now, I think the more interesting question is this. What will happen to this equilibrium system if pressure is increased? Now that's a good question. Well, it turns out that solid water has a greater volume than liquid water. Now we're going to learn about that later, and it's sort of unusual that a solid actually has a greater volume than the liquid from which it came. So, if pressure is applied to this system, the water will shift to relieve the stress by going to a smaller volume. So think about this, if we add pressure, is the system going to want to expand? Of course not, that's going to compound the problem. The system is going to want to contract, it's going to want to go to a smaller volume. Well, what has a smaller volume? Does solid water have a smaller volume or liquid water? Well, it turns out that liquid water is more dense than solid water. It has a smaller volume per unit mass. This means if I add pressure to this equilibrium system, the equilibrium will shift to the right and liquid water will tend to form. So, think about this. Here's a picture of an ice skater. Now, the ice is frozen at temperatures below zero degrees Celsius. Yet, even though this particular individual might be quite frail, might not weigh very much, all of his weight is focused on that very thin skate blade. Now, when that mass is focused on that skate blade, there's quite a bit of pressure on that ice. So this individual might weigh 100, maybe 125 pounds, but it's focused on a very, very small area, so the pressure is quite high. Now, when pressure is added to solid water, remember, the equilibrium is shifted to the right, and so liquid water forms. So in reality, this particular ice skater is not skating on solid water. Since the pressure is so high, it actually causes the water to turn to a liquid, even though the temperature is below zero degrees Celsius. It's shifting that way because the liquid uh, part of water, the liquid phase, excuse me, is more dense. It occupies a smaller volume than the solid phase. So he's actually skating on a very, very thin film of water. Of course, the coefficient of friction is much smaller for a thin film of water, so it can glide graciously across the ice. Now, if the opposite were true, when pressure were added, if it went to the solid phase, if the solid had the smaller volume, then as pressure was applied to the ice, the ice would not melt. The ice would stay in its solid phase and make ice skating itself quite difficult. But since the water for, since water has a smaller volume as a liquid, it makes ice skating possible. All right, boiling point. So, we're still talking about gases and liquids, obviously. So the phenomenon of boiling involves the fact that bubbles of water vapor form anywhere in the liquid. And, of course, since gases have a density smaller than liquids, they rise to the surface. This only occurs if the vapor pressure of the liquid is equal to atmospheric pressure. So if you think about a beaker full of water, in order for water to boil, bubbles need to form. That liquid needs to have enough energy, the liquid particles, to pull away from each other, to expand and to form a gas. If the atmosphere is pushing down on that liquid with a lot of pressure, it makes it more difficult for those bubbles to form. So, as the atmospheric pressure lowers, it becomes easier for that liquid to boil. Or, if the atmospheric pressure increases, it's harder for that bubble to form, and so it will actually raise the boiling point. It is possible for water, then, to boil at a temperature less than 100 degrees Celsius. So you can see on this graph over here, at 100 degrees Celsius, um, if we go up here to this line right here, letter D represents water, um, the 
vapor pressure of water is 760 millimeters of mercury at 100 degrees Celsius. That means when the vapor pressure of the liquid is equal to the atmospheric pressure, and 760 millimeters of mercury is what we call standard atmospheric pressure, water begins to boil. Now, in Salt Lake City, where we live, the atmospheric pressure on a typical day is about 645 millimeters of mercury. So, if we go to 645 millimeters of mercury, right about here on our graph, you will notice that the boiling point of water is slightly lower than 100 degrees. So it's about 98 to 99 degrees Celsius. So, a better definition for boiling point, instead of the one that we use up here where bubbles of a gas form throughout the liquid, is the temperature where the vapor pressure of the liquid equals atmospheric pressure. Now, it's also possible for water to boil at temperatures higher than 100 degrees Celsius. If the pressure above the water is in excess of 760 millimeters of mercury, more energy is required for the molecules to push apart one against one another, forming a gas bubble. So, this neat little picture here shows at sea level, where the atmospheric pressure on a typical day is about 760 millimeters of mercury, water boils at about 100 degrees Celsius. On type of Pikes Peak in Colorado, where the elevation is about 4,400 meters above sea level, the atmospheric pressure is quite a bit lower, so it's easier for those gas bubbles to form. So the boiling point is only 85 degrees Celsius. And on top of Mount Everest in Tibet, where we're about 8,800 meters above sea level, the atmospheric pressure is so low, it does not require very much energy at all for those liquid particles to turn into gas particles, to push away from each other and to begin to boil. And on top of Mount Everest, the boiling point on a typical day is about 71 degrees Celsius. It's also important to note that different liquids have different boiling points. Of course they do. Not everything boils at 100 degrees Celsius like water. Liquids with low boiling points have particles with low intermolecular attraction for each other. Now this was a topic that we discussed in an earlier chapter when we were drawing Lewis structures and we were determining polarity. These substances evaporate more rapidly and are said to be volatile. So if substances have weak intermolecular attractions, it's easy for those molecules to pull away from each other. They evaporate very easily, and we call them volatile. Think, for instance, of a fingernail polish remover or toenail polish remover. If you ever spill that on your skin, it feels cold. The reason it does is because they evaporate very, very quickly. Remember, evaporation is a cooling process. Now, liquids that boil at high temperatures have high intermolecular forces of attraction and are considered to be non-volatile. So, let's just compare a couple of things really quick before we wrap up for the day. If I were to spill some fingernail polish remover on my driveway on a hot summer day, and I were to spill some motor oil on my driveway on a hot summer day, don't you agree that fingernail polish remover is volatile, weak intermolecular forces of attraction? It will evaporate easily. It also will have a low boiling point. Motor oil, on the other hand, will stay there for a long time. Those intermolecular attractions are much higher. will have a higher boiling point, and those are considered non-volatile. Now, before I leave, there's a demo that I've done for you on YouTube where we boil water at room temperature. Of course, the way we do that is we reduce the pressure above the liquid. So take a look, search for boil water at room temperature, or search for Hummer Chemistry. That's my YouTube channel. And as you search for that, you can look for boiling water at room temperature and see how we do that.
All right, that's part two of our chapter 10 discussion. We'll continue with part three at a later time. Thank you.